actually be dealing with the same text, but I want to take it in a different direction. <clears throat> As we go through life, we are, find ourselves faced with choices, dilemmas, sometimes uh, decisions of great moment they are going to affect the rest of our days or maybe uh, our future for years to come <clears throat> at least. And we find ourselves pulled in two or more directions at once. So how are we to decide? Uh, we might consult godly friends for advice, and, and that can be helpful, but the fact is, if you ask too many, you will often find multiple opinions, especially if they are Baptists. All right? <clears throat> if you can ask two Baptists, you can get three opinions. All right? So um, we might search the Scriptures... But the decision might not hinge on any particular biblical principle. In other words, you know, it's, it, the Bible doesn't really give us a specific guidance on that issue or that question. So our ta- passage today has one little bit in it in comparison with Acts 9 that gives us a bit of a hint, I think, about how to make such decisions. And so to start with, I want to read both Acts 9 and Acts 22. So Acts 9 first. Uh, but uh, you might want to have, you can open there as well. Keep your finger in Acts 22. We're coming right back over there. So verse 26 of Acts chapter 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. All right, so that's the Acts 9 account of it. So here's our passage, and I'm leaving off the reaction of the crowd. That's not relevant, really, to what we're dealing with. So Acts 22, verse 17. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance, and I saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you, And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by, approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So, in comparing these two passages, do you see the key difference? What's the difference between these passages? This is your chance for audience participation. Maureen. That's right. So Maureen uh, caught, caught it exactly. In verse 30 of Acts chapter 9, the brethren learned of these threats, and they arranged, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. All right? That in Acts 22, he testifies that in a trance, the Lord told him to go. So what is going on here? It appears in Acts 9 that Paul acts on the advice of the disciples alone. In Acts 22, he, it appears that he acts on the advice of the vision alone. So I put in my notes, these facts are not in conflict. Both the disciples and the Lord acted in concert. We're going to harmonize these two passages. Now, we don't know which was first. Whether God gave Paul the vision first, or whether the disciples came to Paul first, and the Lord confirmed it with a vision. So we don't have any indicators. You know, uh, the Lord gave me this vision and then the disciples came to me or the brothers came to me and got me out of town. Or the brothers came to me and said, you know, Paul, you really need to go and uh, you probably shouldn't stay here. And uh, then um, you, uh, and then the Lord uh, uh, confirmed it with the vision afterwards. We don't know. Okay? That's irrelevant to the story. It doesn't matter. But the key is that we see in this event, we see this. The works of God and man. The works of God and man. So when we are making decisions, since God doesn't give us a direct vision, 
as he gave Paul, how can we proceed in faith in these circumstances? So my proposition today, in living for God, we search out all we can know for our life choices, and we trust God when we make them. All right? So, <clears throat> the circumstances leading to Paul's decision. That's the first thing that we're going to talk about. Well, the circumstances in Acts chapter 9 are from a third, from, are, are written, are given to us, are delivered to us from a third party perspective. Now, that is from Luke's writings. In Acts 22, it's, it's a first person perspective through a third party voice. Luke is writing down what Paul said. So, you get the difference there. All right. So, in Acts chapter 9, Paul, the recent convert, returns to Jerusalem where he formerly made havoc of the church. That's the King James translation in Acts 8.3. Paul, you know, it says, there's that famous phrase, breathing out threatenings and slaughter. That's, I just, you know how that King James English, it's so picturesque, you know. And he made havoc. That's another picturesque expression of the church. He was bringing people into arrest. Well, in fact, this is what made them fearful of him. In Jerusalem, like, you know, really? You're a disciple now? Really? You know, like, remember what you said, you know, three years ago? You know, maybe there's people in that group. Says, you, you took me, you, you had me arrested, had me beaten. Okay, or you had my uncle killed or whatever. You know, there, I mean, this is the kind of, suppose we had that kind of experience here. Suppose we had a, a time of state persecution and there were, there was a, an informer who came into our assembly and named names and reported us to the, the officials, and then three years later he shows up and says, yeah, I'm a Christian now. Go, oh, really? So, all right, so that's the situation. So he joins the church and gains their confidence, and it's boldly proclaiming Jesus. So it's named in three verses. It's mentioned that he was doing this in Damascus. At Damascus, verse 27, 927, he spoke out boldly in the name of Jesus. Uh, verse 28, in Jerusalem, he was speaking out boldly in the name of Jesus. And then in verse 29, he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews. So it's repeated, he was constantly advocating for the Lord Jesus Christ. So consequently, the Jews plotted to kill him, and the disciples got him out of Dodge in Acts 9.30. So that's, that's the third party perspective. So the circumstances from the first person testimony in Acts 22, Paul is praying in the temple. And the Lord, as we know, we've read through this passage several times, in the vision, warns Paul away from Jerusalem, for the Jews will not listen to his testimony. Now, Paul protests about his unique qualifications. We talked about that, of course, this morning. Paul commands, the Lord commands him to go, nonetheless. He had other plans for him. Now, one thing as a side note. The Lord didn't tell the other apostles to leave Jerusalem. They were equally opposed. In fact, in Acts chapter 12, so this is Acts 9 when Paul is removed. In Acts chapter 12, not too long later, uh, we have the, the Apostle James being put to death. We have the Apostle Peter being put in prison and likely to be put to death except the Lord delivers him and he flees perhaps to uh, Antioch. That might have been the point at which he visited Antioch. In any case, uh, the Lord didn't send the other apostles away. That's the point. God, so God isn't bound by the plots of evil men. These men were plotting against Paul and wanting to kill him, but that really wasn't the issue in getting him out of Jerusalem. The issue was that God had plans for him elsewhere. So those are the circumstances leading to Paul's decision. Now, the definition of providence. What we're talking about here is God's working in the world. How does God work in the world? How does God work in my life? And we do know this. We, we have this sense. You'll hear people say, well, everything happens for a reason. Uh, what is that reason? Well, we don't know. But, it, it, but we believe innately, I think, that there is someone in charge. Even the lost have this sense. Someone's in charge. Uh, if you try to ask them who it is that has the reason, <laughs> that might put them on the spot. But anyway, we have this doctrine called providence. Now, I'm going to quote from 
two Presbyterians, a father and son, who are, I suppose, of all the Presbyterians in the world, my favorites, I would have to say. Uh, they're both dead now, but... Okay. A. A. Hodge, Al Archibald Alexander Hodge. Uh, he's the son. His, he says this, in, uh, this is in his Outlines of Theology, Providence, okay, from, this is Latin terms, pro and video. Okay? Clearly means, or literally means, foresight. And then a careful arrangement prepared beforehand for the accomplishment of predetermined ends. All right, so for, pro providence, pro, seeing ahead of time. But in terms of the, the doctrine, it means that there is an end in view. God's end in view is his ultimate glory. He's, all creation is going to praise God. Now, when the fall happened, it looked like God's plan in creation was, um, was, was defeated. And then we see all of this human history and we see all of the terrible things that have happened through human history. And then you get to the end when the Antichrist is enthroned and so on and so forth. And you think, man, God's plan is just off the track. It's not happening. And then Jesus is going to show up. And that, everything that is happening is headed to that end. All right? So even in our lives, Although we are small parts of the story, our lives fit into that ultimate plan. That's the idea of providence. I probably got ahead of myself. Let's see what Charles Hodge has to say. This is the father. And Charles Hodge, now, like they are Presbyterians, so I disagree with a lot of their theology. They're heavily Calvinistic. Uh, well, how could you not be cal heavy if you're not Calvinistic? But they're, uh, so, so I don't agree with many things they teach, but there are some insights, nevertheless. So Hodge says, Charles Hodge, God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. So God orchestrates to a certain God orchestrates our world. Now, you could take this to the point, and I think this is where Calvinism errs, it takes it to the point of almost fatalism. What fatalism is? Fatalism is the idea that everything is programmed and there is no free will and everything just happens. So, you know, uh, the, the joke about the Presbyterian who fell down the stairs and he gets up and dusts himself off and says, thank God that's over. You know, that, that was predetermined. He was going to fall down those stairs. Oh, well, glad that one's done. Well, that's sort of a, a humorous attempt, but... I don't think they, they would want to ascribe to that, but that is the tendency of the, of the view. But it is true, God has an end in view, and God is orchestrating that end. And we, we gain this definition, these definitions, and this understanding from various parts of the Scripture, but I don't have time to develop all of that to, this afternoon. So A. A. Hodge again, the son, God continually controls and directs the actions of all his creatures so that while he never violates the law of their several natures, he yet infallibly causes all actions and events, singular and universal, to occur according to the eternal and immutable plan embraced in his decree. Now, he, the Hodges would probably disagree with me about the decree and what God's ultimate end is working out to be. Uh, they might very well. But I think he's, what he's saying here is that God is controlling our world so that he's not violating, he says, the law of their several natures. I would add in this, he's not violating the individuality of any person. You make choices. It's, God isn't programming you to make a choice. You can make a choice outside of what God would prefer, what you might say is God's will. People do it all the time. Uh, and God isn't to blame for your wrong choice. Okay? Uh, but nevertheless, his purposes can't be defeated by your wrong choices. You see what I'm saying? Everything will work together for good. Okay, It will work together. His plan will come together. That's the idea of providence. All right. So it is illustrated in our passages. In Acts 9, the brethren, including Paul, are active in the decision-making. 
there must be there must be something of a story behind this because it says there in Acts nine uh, that they they took him up to uh, Caesarea and then sent him on a ship to Tarsus. Okay, that was his native city. All right, now the distance from Jerusalem to Caesarea on modern roads is about seventy five miles. Okay, so that would be like uh, here to uh, where. Courtney? Parksville? Oh, Parksville, yeah. Here to Nanaimo is 100. Okay, so, yeah. All right, so about that far. So, and of course, they don't have cars. And they don't have modern highways. So, they, it's, gonna, it's a, a couple days journey. And there's these Jews in Jerusalem who are hot to, plotting to kill Saul. So, and all we get is, in the Bible, there's, like I say, there must be something of a story to this. We don't know the story. It would be very interesting to know that story, but we don't know it. So, uh, now, Paul in chapter 23 is going to take the same trip under Roman guard on horseback. Okay? But he would be hot-tailing it on foot with the brethren, I'm sure, and they would be uh, maybe under the cover of night, and who knows what all else. Anyway, he got out of there. But in Acts 22, the Lord is prominent in the decision to get out of Jerusalem, right? So we have both things happening. Man acts and God acts. And the two are in concert. That's what I want you to see about our passage. This is the providential leading of God in Paul's life. All right, so the last thing we want to talk about is the need to trust providence. When we face decisions, many factors come into play. So we can ask questions like this. What impact will this have on my family? Right? Uh, where, if you're parents and you're making a decision and about you know, a job, about a, even about a house you're going to buy, or a, a, or a place you're going to live, whatever it is, that will have an impact on the life of your children. Uh, I was speaking to our visitor this morning, he's a native Victorian, one of those rare people. Like We have a few in our congregation who, are, who were born here, grew up here their whole life, but a lot of us are from somewhere else. And, you know, so I, we, he says, yeah, you foreigners. <laughs> you foreigners. Well, yeah, I am. But you know what? My kids are natives. Well, except for Duncan. The, the, you know, the, all, the other four were all born here in Victoria. This is their native country. Now, that has shaped their lives because of a decision my wife and I made 30-some years ago. right? And it has, for, it has forever shaped their life. So that's what my point is. What impact will this have on my family? What impact will it have on others, on my church, on my relationships, on my current ministry? These are questions we are, that come into play. What opportunities will come my way if I remain in the status quo? You know, maybe I've got a job and I don't particularly like it, but, but there's still, and they have an opportunity for another one. Well, there's still, there's, there's opportunities in the old job. You know, sometimes, you know, like they say, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, but the, but the, uh, the, the, this side of the fence still has opportunities. And so we have to evaluate that. There's also new opportunities if I change from status quo. All right? And so there are endless possibilities here. Now, all these things that are coming into play as we make decisions. And we will often hear somebody say, well, I prayed about it. Sometimes that statement has the effect of shutting up every question that might arise. Somebody says, well, are you sure you should be doing that? Well, I prayed about it. Oh, well, you know, that's like your trump card. You know, you know no, uh, no discussion anymore. You prayed about it, then there's nothing I can say. Right? Nevertheless, prayer should be part of your decision making. Through prayer, unite with God in what God is doing. And I, uh, the reason I got thinking about this, I read a statement on this from uh, Millard Erickson in his Christian Theology, which I didn't put on the screen, but I'll just read it to you. It appears from Scripture that in many cases God works in a sort of partnership with humans. God, God does not act if humans do not play their part. What do you think of that statement? 
Now, he's going to justify this by several scriptural examples. You read that, you think, really? Yeah, okay, well, here's an example, Mark 6. Jesus could not perform many miracles in Nazareth. Why? Because, the, because of the Nazarenes. They, they didn't believe in him. They weren't following him. It says he could not. Okay, so God does not act if humans do not play their part. Or, for example, we have the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. He's asking healing for his servant, and he is rewarded for his faith. Jesus says, I have not seen such faith, no, not in Israel. And he heals the servant. Recall that story. So, the action of the man works in concert with the work of God. It's kind of a profound thing to think about. Now, uh, the woman uh, with the issue of blood uh, likewise found God's response because of her faith. Remember, she came up and touched the hem of his garment. The Lord stopped and he says, Be it unto you according to your faith. So her action works with God. All right, That's the point we're making. Now, let's talk about God's interest in his creation. And I have uh, a couple of references. I am going to read a couple of them. But anyway, God controls nature so that ultimately his will takes place. This is all pro- verses about providence. Psalm 135, 5 through 7 uh, is one place where it talks about that. God involves himself in the outworking even of the animal kingdom. So Psalm 104, 21 through 29 speaks to that, if you want to look that up. God orders human history and the destiny of nations. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. All right, so God intervenes in individual lives. Here's Hannah praising God for the son that God gave her. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. She's singing about his intervention in her life. David and many other faithful saints put his trust in God's work. Psalm 31, 14 to 15. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. So, God is interested in his creation. God works with men who work with him. We, we see this in the scriptures. So, back to Paul and his trust in God in Acts 22 and Acts 9. Paul and the brethren acted. But God also acted, leading Paul through the first, second, and third missionary journeys to that moment on the steps of the castle of Antonia. God was at work behind the scenes. Did Paul have an audible voice? Sometimes he did. Sometimes he just went with his impressions and he served the Lord and preached the gospel and built the church. And that's how we live in concert with the Lord. We act and we trust. Now, we don't have the audible voice now, but we trust. We discern the seasons. We look at the scriptures. We, we believe that we, if we're serving the Lord, we are in his will. We try to serve him and we try to discern what is the best time. As I was thinking about this, I didn't write this into my notes, but I was thinking about an illustration of this from uh, the life of my uncle, who uh, some of you, I've talked about him before. He was a missionary in India, I think for 12 years, and then uh, various reasons they couldn't go back to India. He pastored a church in Edmonton for a number of years, and then he uh, uh, got involved in a Bible college in Pakistan, which uh, is still going. And uh, his assistant is still involved in teaching there, in, uh, off and on, in that college in Pakistan. So very remarkable work. But uh, my uncle uh, would go to this college. He spends several months there teaching uh, Bible classes, teaching the students, preparing them for the ministry. And the Lord is doing a wonderful work amongst those graduates in the villages of Pakistan. There are Christians being born again, being baptized, churches being built. And it's, it is remarkable, even in that very Muslim uh, antagonistic nation. Well, guess where my uncle was on September 11, 2001? He was in Pakistan teaching in this school. 
And I wrote him a note uh, about September 15th or so by email. Are you still there? <laughs> Don't you think you should come home? He said, no, no, I'm fine. I'm staying inside. I'm not going outside. I'm, I've got this course to teach. I want to get it finished. Well, okay. I said, you know, a, a live coward is, is more use than a dead hero. <laughs> he said, oh, no, I'm good, I'm good. I'm trusting the Lord. Okay. So along about November, the people in the college said, came to him and said, you know, we think it's probably time you should go. And the brethren got him up to Caesarea and off to Tarsus, if you want to put it that way. Well, now, what was going on? Men acted, and God acted. Now, God could have taken him. It could have been the time, but he allowed him to live on a number of years and uh, passed away at a good old age and uh, is now in heaven. But men acted, and God acted. And so here's our proposition. In living for God, we search out all we can know for our life choices. And then we trust God when we make them. Because God's involved here. And it, 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 it's interesting to see that we have both perspectives in these accounts of Paul's decision making about that incident in Jerusalem. So he trusted God and so should we. And that's how, that's how we make decisions. We, sometimes we're not given any more light than that. We're not given that voice. God doesn't get, he just doesn't do that anymore. Or he doesn't do it for us. And so we have to say, okay, here are the facts. These are the things I know best of all. And it seems like this is the time. And it's interesting how somehow things just work in such a way that we move and it seems like it's the right time to do things. And God works in our lives. So trust him and live for him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for your grace to us, your many blessings. We pray that you would help us to be trusting you in our lives and working for you in everything that we do. Thank you for everything you're doing in our church and in our assembly. We pray you'll help us to be faithful to you each day as we serve you wherever we are. In Jesus' name.